I realized at that moment that I really needed to learn how to not control but master my emotions and also master my body. How's it going, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 658. My guest today is Stephen Matulowicz. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I host the show. I founded Whistlekick. Why? Well, because I love traditional martial arts and I wanted to make and do some martial arts stuff and make some martial arts friends. And here we are quite a few years later, and that's what we're doing. If you want to go deeper and see the whole gamut of things that we're working on, go to whistlekick.com. You're going to find links to all the products, the projects, the services, the things that we do as an organization to add depth, context, value to your life as a martial artist. One of the things you'll find over there, well, it's our store. It's one of the ways we pay the bills here because in case you didn't notice, you didn't pay for this show, but we still have to cover expenses like hosting and all that good stuff. Well, I'll make you a deal. If you take a look at the store at whistlekick.com, find yourself a, a shirt or some protective equipment or something else that makes you happy, use the code PODCAST15. It'll save you 15% and we all win. Now, if you want to know more about this show, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio gets its own website and it is at, guess what? Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com because no one's ever accused me of creatively naming things. We've got two episodes for you each and every week, an interview on Mondays like this. We bring you topic or other sort of conversation on Thursdays. Yeah, like eight episodes a month about martial arts for you, the martial artist, to connect, educate, and entertain everybody who's listening. Now, if you really appreciate these shows, I would appreciate you doing something in return. And you can start with the easy and the free stuff, like tell your training partners about what we're doing or share an episode, post a link to one of our social media graphics that we put out there. Or if you want to go a little bit deeper, you could think about contributing to our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. For as little as $2 a month, we're going to give you exclusive content back. The more you're willing to throw our way, the more we're going to throw your way. You're going to find stuff you will not find anywhere else on Whistlekick. And we're doing a great job with it, at least in my mind, because people rarely stop contributing. So that's kind of cool. Kind of a good way to measure success, isn't it? My guest today has a journey. We all have a journey. And of course, here we are on Martial Arts Radio. We are talking about a martial arts journey. But this journey is a little bit different. And yet, it's not. You know, we, we hear about a particular well, a few particular aspects of Stephen's life, his training, that I think is far more common than we realize, than we talk about. And I say that based on the experience of hosting this show and talking to people before and after and on the side. And I really enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure you will too. And I'm not going to say any more. I'll see you in the outro. Hey, Stephen, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for thanks for doing this. You know, it's when people come on the show, at the very least, they're giving of their time, and I'm always super appreciative of that. But let's let's be real; it's not hard to get a martial artist to want to talk about martial arts, <laughs> <laughs> especially when the majority of us are surrounded by people who aren't martial artists and you know don't want to hear us talk about it anymore. Does that does that describe you? Um. Well, yes or no. Um, I do enjoy talking about martial arts to people that, uh, that like to do martial arts. I just have a very large range of what that means. <laughs> mm. Um, you know, I've done, uh, for, I, 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 just to explain, I'm 51 years old. I've been doing martial arts for about 35 years of various forms. Um, I've also, um, included in the, the definition of martial arts. I've done different forms of uh, weapons combat um, that are also European based. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, again, I, I, it depends on still who you're talking about and what we're talking about. For uh, sure. Um, also, uh, you know, I, uh, I take a long time to warm up to people sometimes. 
Well, it's a good thing this isn't a five or 10 minute show then. <laughs> we <laughs> got true. plenty of time. That's right. We got plenty of time. We probably won't break the record. The record is somewhere like three and a half, three hours and 45 minutes. It's, it's oh, crazy wow. long. We won't be able to do that. I've got, <laughs> but I think by the time we would get through that, there's two other interviews that I'm doing today. So we don't have right. that much time, but we got plenty of time, more than enough time, I'm sure, for us to to talk about your journey. So let's let's talk about your journey and let's talk about the beginning of your journey. You, you, you said you gave us your, your age and you gave us a rough amount of time you've been training. So it sounds like you started as a teenager, which not a lot of people start as teenagers. What, what's the story there? Like, like why, why did you start training as a teenager? Well, um, the, uh, there, there were a lot of different factors. So of course, going into that, um, you know, as a kid, I was, bullied a lot i i was the person that that in my in my class um if you wanted to pick on someone it was probably me <laughs> um i tended to be very emotional um i was very bright um the teachers tend to pick on me because well not pick on me but uh, would choose me in class because you know i i uh, enjoyed learning and for that, um, I usually was the person that was considered the outcast that anybody could pretty much pick on. And uh, that's really where it starts. It's like that happened for me as of first grade. And by the time I got into about middle school, and this is the you know 70s into the 80s. So martial arts, um, how to fight, those kind of things really wasn't discussed. It really wasn't around. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've had... You know, there, there are movies and, you know, Bruce Lee was in the 60s and into the 70s. Um, and so there, there was exposure, but like, you know, for basically um, suburbia on um, Massachusetts, you know, in the 70s to 80s, there really wasn't a lot of talk. There really wasn't a lot of exposure. So for somebody like me, there's no, there was no way of uh, seeming to uh, deal with um, all of this. Uh, negative uh, um, attacks and, and things from yeah. from my peers, so you know it's it was it was very difficult. And um, what got me into that change um, was you know over time I became very uh, angry and frustrated with uh, just dealing with my peers on the whole. And to the point where, kind of flashing forward um, up until about the 10th grade, that's really where it became pivotal, where I realized that all of this, uh, all of this experience, all of this anger, all of this frustration of not being able to somehow take care of myself, defend myself, um, or at least be accepted with my peers, that came to a point where um, I actually had started developing friends and somebody who uh, was very often bullying me started to bully my friends. And I actually mentally snapped. I got angry. I started to attack this gentleman. And um, I almost put him in the hospital. I was so angry that I did not realize that I was screaming at the time. Apparently. Um, he was like hitting me with like a tennis racket that he had in his hand and I didn't feel it. And my understanding and uh, comprehension of that experience from that time beyond that is, one, I never want to do that again. I don't want to suddenly snap and have all this emotion come through and be give me this lack of control. And second of all, I have no idea how to fight. I think at the time I was still like putting my thumb inside my fist so that I would like dislo dislocate my thumb, that kind of thing. And so I realized at that moment that I really needed to learn how to not control, but master my emotions and also master my body. And within the same month or so, two things happened. <laughs> One was I saw the movie Bloodsport. Mm. Um, classic yeah and uh, i mean what that showed me is that i mean th there was a line as to what martial arts was 
again at the time. But what Bloodsport did for me is realize that there are lots of styles. There are lots of ways to get involved with learning uh, how to defend yourself or how to compete. And this was very exciting for me. Secondly, what happened was um, I went to a new barber uh, for me. Um, and my barber happened to be um, an instructor for Shaolin Kung Fu. And he didn't have like a storefront. He didn't have like any real advertisement. It was all word of mouth. He was doing it out of his basement. And, um, you know, I, I admitted to him some frustrations that I was having and, and some of the things that had been happening to me. So um, he invited me into uh, <laughs> to his uh, to his dojo, and that's really where it started. Um, and that for me was in the process is trying to improve my body, improve my mind, improve how I am interacting with the world. So that's, I think that answers most of what you said. <laughs> yeah. But that's, yeah. the, that's really the start of things is that I felt in a, in a very dark place and martial arts was my way out. And um, I pretty much haven't stopped since. I mean, <laughs> and, and that's the other thing why, why the journey has been so rocky. It's like, you know, over the years, it's like I've gone to, what, well, um, specifically four different disciplines i've trained with people that like at least another half dozen people off and on over the years like when i'm between like different different uh, dojos and uh you know i've just been meeting people multiple styles multiple ways of training multiple ways of doing things and it's and in many ways it's been great but it's also been frustrating <laughs> i'm sure I'm sure you, so. you, you just put a lot of stuff on the table. We, we, we could probably do a series of conversations, just spidering off of what you talked about. But I, I think the piece I want to dig into is this notion that you were maybe not okay, maybe not comfortable, but accepting of harassment. Mm until that harassment extended to people you cared about. Mm. That that was the tipping point for you. That's where you snapped. Mm -hmm. Have you spent any time exploring that and, and thinking about why that was the, the straw for you? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it's like I, as a person, am... am I, I like to think of myself as um, in, an introverted extrovert mm -hmm. in that I feel that a lot of my situations over the years seem to force me into this tendency to basically push and look at everything inward. When I connect with someone, with something, I put all of my energy and all of my emotion into trying to be with that uh, that person and you know at that time like i said i was developing friends i was um it was difficult to uh for me but i thought to be able to even hold on to somebody and to have somebody who's supporting me and, and showing that back to me i didn't want to lose that i didn't want that level of suffering to start to happen to other people you know i can take it I don't want them to have it. Sure. How how did those friends respond after this event? Um, a mixture of things. They they partially, you know, you know, it's like I I got a little scary. <laughs> uh, yeah. I never I never been that, that angry that 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 well crazy. Um, you know, and on top of that, you know, it's, it's, um, the person was actually a little upset because I came to their defense because they can defend themselves just fine. Um, you know, but over time, you know, it's like it didn't really impact our friendship at all. You know, it didn't uh, help the friendship grow or anything like that. It just was something that happened. Mm -hmm. Now, when you when you started training. Mm -hmm. 
Because mm -hmm. if I got my times right, you started training after that, right? Yes. I'm not. Okay. How how long in between? I would say that timing wise, that maybe it was like a month or so after that, okay. maybe two okay. months. It's it's so long ago. <laughs> sure, sure, but but fairly close after. Yes. How, when you when you think about that specific event, but also. I think more importantly, the mindset from which it came. I mean, we're, uh, I can relate to what you're talking about. For someone to, you know, point fingers at me, say things to me, even, you know, maybe put their hands on me in a, a less than ideal, but not quite violent way. I, I, I had a long history of turning the other cheek on that. Mm -hmm. But when I think back on high school as well, you know, similar age, the moment people started touching my friends, okay, well, now, now this is where I'm in your face and it's going to end. Right. So when you started training, was, was that um, protector mindset, was that an asset? Or was that a liability as you work through your martial arts training? I'll be honest that I'm not, I'm not sure how much of a factor it was. Hmm. Uh, because what impacted me of that moment was this complete shift of, uh, uh, of emotion, you know, into this, this total chaos where um, I literally physically couldn't feel pain uh while that was while that was occurring that um overload into emotional chaos um was um frightening for me to become this thing that could just simply let loose so my focus at the time and a lot of my uh, my initial martial arts training was in a way to understand my mentality and understand uh, my physicality and it eventually also incorporated into being a protector and being able to um you know I'm gonna protect my friends be in a situation and be able to uh, to be of uh you know to be to be present and be able to interact in such a way that I can do something to help defend or keep people from being from suffering or being hurt. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, of course, incorporates into it. But the main thing for me was to take this, this thing, this emotional chaos, which I know I'm going to mention it a lot, bunch of times. It's how I usually describe what's going on in my head. Sure. Quite a um, by taking that and being able to find a way to um, not control it, but master it. Um, and I, I mentioned that a lot, too. Um, I find that the word controlling or to, uh, to, to uh, you know, have control over something is a really hard word in English um, because a lot of the times we approach control incorrectly when we're dealing with, you know, dealing with ourselves, dealing with martial arts in the sense that a lot of the times, um, like when you, get, when you get angry, oh, you have to get control of your emotions. A lot of people, when they think that, they, they mentally, like, literally try to squeeze that emotion shut so that there's nothing or that it's shoved down. And that's not healthy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I try to, to very specifically say, no, you need to master it, acknowledge it, have it, and work with it so that it is not overloading you, not controlling you, and be able to move back to... Um, in a more mindful way of working. Okay. All right. So you're training, you're, you're in there, and, you know, I, I'm sure just about anybody listening can get a sense as to what training looks like, right? We, we may all do different martial arts and train differently, but there's still some pretty consistent core elements about the way martial arts is trained so you're going along and what's the first um i guess milestone or or place along your path 
with your training that you know we want to we want to dig into you know is it is it a few months in a few years in what's going on there well the um the milestone or or the 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 thing that was i think the most difficult um to uh, to handle it, it, like over time has really been that um life tends to get in the way sometimes mm. um in this case it's like i thought the school was great um i was having problems for example like uh, the, he had a problem it was his basement so it wasn't uh, there was no real um good air down there so as for somebody who was not really um, athletic at the time. Um, I was having some, you know, some breathing problems because it was just so hot down there and that kind of thing. But, you know, I was making it through, I was, I was getting through it and I, I was starting to gain that self-confidence, um, and, and understand that, you know, even though this was hard, I could get through it. Um, but about, I'd say it was six or eight months into it. Um, and I was starting to really get going with it and, and really enjoying it. Um, he ended up moving to Hawaii hmm. and when that happened, of course, he, he passed, uh, his, uh, school over to, um, the, uh, some of the black belts that are in the studio, but I didn't have the same connection with those people. And it became very difficult for me to, to train at that point. So over the years, part of, um, what has gotten me to train um, or try a different style is not necessarily the martial arts so much as how well I can connect and can work with the instructor. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's been um, a part of a, uh, a sort of a, a, a struggle over time for that. So I, I so to answer your question though I have to really flash to um, my early thirties, <laughs> so about maybe fifteen years later, um, I had been drifting in and out. Like I said, I, I I met a lot of different martial artists over that time, and I, I would train a little bit, but then I would go away, or I was in college, so I'd, I'd have to learn again where I could do this. Um, and I ended up going, uh, moving into Milford, Massachusetts. And, um, it turns out that there was a studio that was literally like a block from the house. And, um, Miss Elaine, uh, who ran the, uh, the studio was an amazing, vibrant person that was really engaged with, uh, her martial arts. In this case, it was, uh, Ed Parker, American Kempo. Mm -hmm. And what I, what for me just got me completely hooked at that point is that part of my frustration with learning was that I always have to question, well, why am I doing this? I mean, like, why am I throwing a punch this way? Why am I kicking this way? What does this do? And part of what she did and apparently what Ed Parker was very insistent upon was explaining that why. And it was something that was missing in a lot of the experiences before then. Even my first training, he was an excellent man. Sifu uh, Isaac was amazing. But he also had the philosophy as well, you'll learn over time. You know, it's like, do it, just try to do it this way. Well, it's actually a little bit different. So, no, I did it exactly the same way, but you're just observing it differently. Okay, but it, I still don't understand why I'm doing this. <laughs> and um, and it wasn't until that time where it's like, oh, it's like we would literally just sit down and say, like, okay, we're going to break down the kata that we're doing. We're, we're going to talk about, well, why do we punch this way? Why is this other style punch slightly different? And that was what really got it for me. It was what allowed me to ingrain it in my mind as to how I can move, how I want to be able to um, be able to defend myself, to be able to do uh, the martial art. Um, and that's, that's what that. Okay. Okay. 
Now, if, if we're talking about that, that transition, that roughly, well, no, transition, that, that time passage, yeah. that 15 years, and you know, you, you've said years. yourself about being in and out of various schools, various styles. And, and certainly some people look at that and they, they look down on that. I'm absolutely not one of them. Anybody who listens to this show knows that that is not my view. I, I, I believe firmly that cross-training or even if it's just trying to find the right school for you is, is far more valuable than just digging roots into a place that doesn't work for you. What were you finding from this, this movement, this shifting around from one school to the next? Was, was there joy in new, these new opportunities or something else? You know, how, how, were you, how were you feeling as you started at these new places? Oh, there's always some form of uh, nervousness, like like when we were talking at the beginning here. It's like you know, it's I, it's that unknown of well, how's this going to go is always difficult for me. So I mean, there's always that into it, but the thing for me is when I am training, and and even then is the way I started to develop is. Everything in the world drops away from me. What becomes um, my world is the, is the school or the trainer at that moment. And I spend, you know, the hour, the two hours, the day, um, working with this, uh, with this person or working with the group. And all I'm doing is focusing on these things, these things that I know are going to help me. Or, or possibly help my uh, environment. And all the things I have to worry about in the world, whether it's you know, my tests or you know, in school or my work or uh, money matters, or all these, none of that matters. None of it equates into anything there. My mind is at peace as I go through whatever I'm doing with them. And that calm in my head is and has always been if i can achieve that with that person i know that that is where i should be at that moment um and that was pretty much how i i um saw into this i am where i am because i need to be here mm -hmm. um and that to get to whatever my next step in life is um i should go through this and try to stay within that now so that I can move up forward into whatever my next journey is going to be. And so if I'm with that instructor for um, an hour and only an hour, then that is an hour well spent. And that's the critical thing for me is to make sure that that time is valuable for myself and for everybody involved. Mm. But yeah, that's... Pretty much it. I, I never got <laughs> caught up in, you know, I need to, you know, I need to stick with Shaolin Kung Fu. I need to learn, you know, Gojiru was a big uh, thing at uh, at my college. Um, but, you know, it's like, and it's like, I never got into um, trying to, to do it, you know, that way or that, that my, my mentality was such that um, I just got really involved in this one school or this one discipline. And that sort of goes with my mindset, too, is that I tend to, as you can see, I tend to ramble. I tend to be interested in a lot of things. And being able to see that in martial arts, how varied it is, and be able to walk through that actually was very exciting to me. That I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was caught up in one thing that I always have to do this. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that I haven't really excelled in any given discipline to a higher level. I have never actually uh, gotten a black belt in any discipline that I've tried because of how long I've been with it, because of um, various situational uh, problems that I've had, um, that kind of thing. You know, you, you said something that I think initially for a lot of people may sound paradoxical. This idea that you're you're shifting around, you're moving from 
you know, one style to another, and you're okay with that. And yet, during that time when you're training, you're, you didn't use these words, but I'm going to, you're all in, you're present. You're embracing where you are as I, I think described as where you are supposed to be. And I really like that because I, th- I think that that's a, um, a pretty solid attitude that any of us can look at and try to bring into the rest of our lives, you know, be open to, to change, to flux, to shifts, because they're always going to be there, but yet try to remain grounded, at least for a bit, where you are. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, when I uh, stopped taking uh, the Ed Parker Kempo, um, there was um, a lot going on in my life. I had to, I, I had moving states <laughs> over, the, over the years, and I tried to find, for example, another uh, Ed Parker school. Um, but again, it was it, it became the situational thing where um, I can't. It, as much as I want to be there, as much as I want to try this style, or even dedicate to that style, you know, make that goal in my head of being able to get to you know a back, black belt level of discipline. Um, it's not always possible. It's like, you know, I, as it is, you know, in, in New England, it's like, you know, to get to some of the major jobs, it's like I'm driving three and a half to four hours a day. And if I have to train like two to three times a week, for example, um, and my school or a school is an hour away one way, um, that's really hard. And it's really hard to... Um, you know, basically, you know, have a wife, have a son, as I do now, um, and be able to not dedicate time and focus on my family, which is also very important. You know, so um, it becomes, it's, it sounds like also at the top of all this, like, you know, that it's a matter of convenience, but it's, um, it's very important that if you're going to be doing anything that, you know, you'd be able to, again, be, if, to use your term, to be all in on all parts of your life. You know, I, you know, I got married. I'm all in for that. I have a son. I'm all in on him. I need time to be with them. And as much as I want to be all in and continue to be all in for karate um, or Shaolin or just general martial arts, I still need to make sure that I've got time for all of that. Sure. Sure. But you're all in on life. I try to be, we've, yeah. <laughs> we've all got the same 24, but we've got to carve it up based on our priorities. And if you have family and training and job and, 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 you know, anybody listening is likely nodding along saying, I struggle with this. I want to train more, but where do I find the time? Right. Right. And it's, it's not a judgment. We, we've all got to you know, we, we get our one shot at this and we've got to put these pieces in, in an order that makes sense for us. And it doesn't mean you can't change them at any given time. You can, but we still have to have some faith that, that the arrangement is sensible. You know, and now talking with you about this, I, I realized that uh, the reason why um, uh, Sifu Isaac uh, went to Hawaii all those years ago is the, he learned that there was some style of kung fu that he did not know that um, there was a master on the, on the main island that he wanted to go and train with. And that's why he was mainly gone. So in that, in that respect, it's like I'm realizing that that's sort of what I'm doing is that I am... Everything that I'm doing, it's like you can, of course, become the person you need to be staying within your discipline. But at the same time, you also need to know when you need to expand beyond that or that you can expand beyond. Um, you know, the nice thing about these days is like, you know, I, I live in an area where um, there are literally dozens of different martial arts schools around here. There, you can take your pick. Um, and that's great. You know, and when I started that, really wasn't the case um but for now um i just started to try to learn before covid happened uh wing chun and the main reason why or the, the two reasons why um and the main one about my point here <laughs> is um that i saw wing chun as an 
excellent extension to whatever discipline you have. Um, it's very, for me, for me, it's very, it's a very different style. And, um, it, what it has to offer can help make you a better martial artist in that you have, I don't know, uh, expanded your investment portfolio in martial arts. Mm. Um, we Chung is point, point blank range fighting for the most part. Not a lot of the times we're dealing with range, we're dealing with power, we're dealing with uh, with different types of uh, different types of focus, how we're moving our body or whatever. But a lot of that point blank range fighting is not something I've, I've really ever experienced or seen in other martial arts. I'm sure that they have it, uh, but for me, uh, in my situation, I'm like, you know what? I really want to add this, and so I've been trying to do that. And once. Uh, once things are a little bit better with COVID, I will be going back to the school because uh, I really want to know that. You know, I can see all the videos I want. I can, you know, watch uh, various movies with uh, with people that know how to do that, and that's great. But but since its design is to be able to use your uh, opponent's motion against them and be able to actually feel how they move as you move. Um, you need to be in contact. So COVID makes that a little difficult. Sure. Yeah. It's, we are in a very weird time and obviously it affects everything. You know, we, we, we talk about it a bit on this show because I, I, I think, I think the problem in, in, if you look at it the right way, it can also be the solution. You know, I, I, I don't know what the solution is, you know, to the broader thing. I, I don't, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a little bit outside my scope. Um, but I think for those of us looking to train, there's always, there's always a way, it's always a way, a way forward. Right. You now, when, when you, when you look at all of these options, mm -hmm. you know, you, you mentioned that I think even near where you are now, you've got more options and you could probably ever, reasonably put some time into how do you choose how do you decide where you want to try and what school is worth investing some of your time and money energy and then for me it comes back to the trainer mm. um you know i you know when i was in this area um my son was born and i'm like you know i, I really need to find something not only for him eventually but for myself um, I went around to a lot of schools, I emailed them, and just to hear how they presented themselves and to try to talk to some of the instructors. And I ended up uh, picking a school in Plastow um, so that uh, because, again, of the person I talked to, the instructor, again, very much like uh, Miss Elaine, he was very energetic, very knowledgeable, and was very engaging with me in that conversation and that had a lot to do with why i uh, i ended up staying there for for as long as i did i, mean, I think it's been or was about five to seven years about seven years i think there that sounds nine now and i started mm, closer 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 to five hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's how I ended up picking is just having, being able to have that kind of relationship with the instructor or with the school. Um, you know, I, I was able to bond with a couple of people in the class. I thought they were great. And, you know, and they were also very engaged and wanted, uh, were learning and were working hard. And I said, okay, sure. This is where I want to be. <laughs> you know, and it's not uh, too much of an impact on drive time. It's not that far away. So. Yeah. So let's do that. Um, some schools, um, some schools these days, a lot of their teaching curriculum are not for people my age, and that also was something that was difficult. Um, I know that from um, you know again, it's uh, back at uh, you know back at uh, Miss Elaine's school. We also were talking about. 
you know, you know, would I become eventually become an instructor? Would I start my own school? So I, I also learned a lot about what it takes to do that. So I also get it. There are a lot of different um, methods for developing the school, and a lot of the focus is on uh, very young kids or or even up to the age of teenagers, and after that, it sort of just disappears a lot of the time. Or at least from my perspective, that's that's the way. Well, it is. I I would agree. You know, so that was also part of the, part of the problem is that I look at, at, at a website or I talk to the person, and they were really almost <laughs> almost discouraging me from trying to join because they were so geared to the younger people. So you know, it's like again, it's it's a matter of you know when I'm talking to them or when I'm there um, that I can see that um, somebody now myself in the 50s um can be comfortable being 50 there um the greatest thing uh one of the greatest things about the Wing Chun class was almost everybody in that class was like my age hmm. that's not uh, common what why yeah. do, you, do you have any have any insight as to what it was about that class that attracted folks your age um I obviously can't talk for everybody in the class. From my perspective, um, it is because, again, it is uh, it is something that has been put forward as a self defense that is is good or easier for older people um, because it is using this, um, um, you know, it, it's not. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not like, you know. Uh, any kind of athletic jumps or kicks or or anything along like that so that somebody who is older can get into it and get into it easier and can get very far in it. And maybe that's part of it. Um, I also n- uh, noticed that a lot of the people that were in the class were not only older, but they were also uh, vets. And that made me, it made me interested in the mindset of Wing Chun in that I wonder or I theorize whether um, the people in the class were there to learn how to defend themselves too, and not just, I don't know, uh, there's, I've been looking, uh, I've been talking to, to some people that there's, there's two distinct mindsets sometimes when we're dealing with martial arts and why people are training. Um, for me, it's always been about defending myself or defending other people. Um, more than any other aspect of, of martial arts. And I have a feeling that that's, at least that's the vibe that I got off in that class is that all these people were there to learn how to better defend yourself when, when you're getting older, when you're getting slower, when you're starting to have physical disabilities. This this type of martial art can help you. And I think that's great. Right on. Now, you mentioned the idea of, of, of opening a school mm-hmm. and... Whether or not you did, when I talk to people about opening a school, the part that I find most interesting is how they would put their own personal stamp, their own philosophy of their martial training into that school. So if you'd indulge me, if you had a school and I was to show up as a prospective student, what might I notice that isn't necessarily revolutionary or dramatically different? If I was to watch, you know, a couple of classes go away and someone said, hey, Jeremy, what did you think of Stephen's school? And I described it. What would I be describing? What would I see there? I would hope that what you would describe would be something to the effect of the level of engagement of the instructor to the student. Um, A lot of the times, in order to be able to try to convey as much information as possible to to get people um, to be uh, be, uh, working on on different types of uh, philosophies or to be working on uh, their bodies, working on their mind, etc., you start to get into this curriculum, to this way of just trying to teach everyone in exactly the same way so that you can try to get everybody the same experience. Um, I find that that is very beneficial in many ways, but uh, for somebody like me that 
has uh, has some some difficulties uh, mentally, um, and also because people are different, people do have different choices and different ways of living. That um, you do have to learn how to not only um, adapt the martial arts to whatever your situation is, but the instructor has to listen and learn how to adapt how they're instructing to the person that they're teaching. And so that would be my hope is that that desire for that engagement with the instructor, which I've always had, I would hope that at least I, that would be what I would convey to you, that you would feel like you came from that class and went, man, he was great. <laughs> he showed me all these things. I had these questions and he was right there to answer them and he had, a, had an awesome answer or he was able to look <laughs> you know, look in, the, in his notes to be able to find it, uh, to, to deal with my questions. That's what I would like to do. Mm. Sounds like a great place. Sounds like some place I would train. <laughs> do you think you would open a school is that is that on the horizon um my situation is such at this point that i probably not um my job at the moment is 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 the desires a lot of travel mm. um, and that is actually one of the reasons why i don't have a school right now um i was uh i was offered uh, to essentially co-teach at a school in londonderry a long time ago and i agreed to that and it didn't go through because i shifted to this job where i'm, I'm spending you know at the time i was spending literally months away I, and i can't do that <laughs> um you know if my situation changed in such a way where i could I would. I know that I would be home all the time. Um, would I consider having a school? Sure. Um, but then it comes down to, well, what am I? What am I going to be teaching? Am I essentially creating my own form of martial arts? Should I get to a level of distinction in a certain form so I can say, well, yeah, I am a black belt. You know, in this form, I also know all these other things. This is what I want. I want to offer you is this this diverse style. Um, you know, if I could do something like that, that would be good. I still have that mental hurdle in my mind that I want to have that level of distinction and a di discipline before I even consider that. Makes sense. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah, it's but but at the same time, you know, it's a bit, I've had talks to people about that. At the same time, that's also a roadblock. You know, it's like if I got in my head, oh, I need to wait until I'm here. But it's something I really want to do. Is that really valuable? You know, do I have the skill to actually bring this bring this about? Do I do I need to actually wait? What you know? Why why is this such a problem? You know, why is that hurdle there? Why don't I just do it? Well, I, I'm I'm gonna if if I may, I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate that there are probably two things going on there. One, um, despite your experience and your time in. There are people who would point at your admission. You have not earned a, a black belt. Mm. And that doesn't bother me. I'll learn from anybody. I don't, I don't care what, what you're doing. And, and we see that now in uh, some Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools mm. where the day-to-day -day operations of a class might be run by a brown, purple, or I, I've even heard of some classes being run by blue belts. You know, I see nothing wrong with that. To me, if someone has knowledge that I don't have, I, I don't care how, how, how much more knowledge they have. If, if you have one thing you can show me that I can learn from, I'm, I'm all in. You know, if, if I go to, I, I don't have children, but let's say I had children, would I expect all of my children's kindergarten teachers to have masters or PhDs in education? No. I, I expect that they can ex show compassion to the five-year-olds and help them with nap time and keep them from cutting each other's hair off, right? Like, I, I think depending on where you are, that bar shifts and should shift. Uh, and, and then the second piece that I think might be applicable to you and, and kind of interests me is the ability or, or desire to share information related to anything, in this case, martial arts, isn't necessarily tied down to a formal school. I don't have a formal school, but I'm going to guess that there are quite a few people listening who have learned something from my efforts with Whistlekick and this show and you know other stuff that we've done because 
I don't have a conventional school. That, at least for now, does not work for me. Maybe in the future, but I still like to share what I know and what I think about. Sometimes that's all that's important, I guess, is, is not to have a brick and mortar place to, uh, to experience whatever it is that we're talking about. It's a matter of two people at least getting together and being able to say, okay, let's do this. Exactly. That, that is, I, you sum that up beautifully. So l- let's talk about the future then. If it's not, if it's not a school, or, or may not be, you know, regardless, let's put that piece aside. You know, you, you've, you've brought up your age a couple times, you know, you, you still got plenty of good years left. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. It doesn't sound like you're someone who's going to reach any kind of milestone, whether it be rank or age or, or something else and say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. It sounds like you're a lifer. And that's a good thing in my mind. So what, what might the future hold? Where where do you want to go with your martial arts? That is a very good question. I don't tend to think very far into the future um, because of my um, attempts for, for myself to try to have a, a mindful way of living to try to live more now than in the future i don't normally contemplate you know you know the qu- question's like well, what are you going to do five years from now I'm like, i don't know breathe i hope <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, um, that's the best answer to that <laughs> i i've asked that question quite a few times that is the best answer i've ever heard but yeah it's like you know it's like uh, I have always thought that what would be great would, uh, you know, it's like is to be able to not just establish a specific school, but a good space where multiple schools can train. Um, ultimately, I think that if I were to go that route and just say, say you know what, I want to do this, just this, the rest of my life, I think that that's what I would want to do. I, I would not only want to have a school where um, I would be teaching or training and that that's possible, but also to make sure that that school was capable of, of drawing in other schools to train and to show and to, to demo and everything else like that. Hmm. Um, you know, and that being said, I, I'm not sure um, at this point in my life um, whether you know I can move along the road like that. So right now I'm still doing what I, I've been doing, which is that this, <laughs> this, this form of martial arts is cool, I think that this would be good for me. I want to try that. And, you know, so at least, you know, within the next year, I know I'm going to be back in, uh, back in the dojo for, for, for Wing Chun. And I'm going to look forward to that. Um, I want to do more. Their form of um, stiff fighting is yet another style that I've never seen. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. They're separate classes at the school. Oh, um cool. Uh, the school that I was at had, you know, had one form. Ed Parker of the Ed Parker School had another form, and they're all sticks, but it's also all different, and that's amazing too. You know, that so, you know, it's like okay, how is how is a specific school or discipline using different types of weapons? You know, um, like uh, the you know again going back. I think that one of the better head cans that happened to me is when I was going to compete with Bo staff um, in a tournament. And uh, my instructor, Miss Elaine, thought about it. It's like, I am going to teach you um, uh, a form or a, a for the tournament um, that is specifically Japanese style Bo, as opposed to. Um, anything for Shaolin or for Chinese or anything else like that. And it never even occurred to me that that was a thing, that different, uh, but it makes sense, you know, but, but you know, that, uh, you know, different countries, different uh, cultures, different um, experiences are going to have a different way of doing it. But being able to approach and going, wow, that's, you know, they, they hold it this way and they, you know, it's like that they, you know, they have to use both hands and all these things like, you know, they usually don't let go of the staff, uh, staff that kept both hands on it. And maybe that was what I needed as a beginner on bow. 
And that's fine. But just the, the concept that there's just so much more out there. It's like, well, let's, let's learn this. And when I, when I master that, let's learn the other styles. <laughs> yeah. You and I are very similar in this respect. There was a point pre COVID where I was training in, depending on how you looked at it, three or four schools simultaneously, you know, not three days a week at each of them, you know, uh, certainly didn't have time for that, but actively engaged in these different ideas and training in different ways with different people, different concepts. And I, and I loved it. And I, I think you and I are probably kindred spirits in that way because it's all good mm -hmm. and to learn more of it and to, to piece it all together in this weird puzzle. I just think is so much fun. sounds like you're similar. Yeah. It's, I'm just trying to get through life that way. There's yeah. just so much there. And I mean, I know that at least in our culture, that there is a focus of saying, uh, what is it? Um, uh, I heard an interview from the child paparazzi basically said that in your life you should choose one chair meaning find the thing that you like find the thing you enjoy and do just that well we have this we now have a culture where people have jobs that are very specific and that's great and then for many people that there's a joy in that there they feel that they have a completeness to their lives because they have that focus that they have that command of the knowledge um, and command of, of whatever it is that they're doing. But there are people, I think like you and I, if I can say that, that um, that feels restrictive in many ways, that our completeness isn't defined by having uh, complete mastery of X. It's more in the adventure of being able to add on to that and add more. Maybe, maybe we're, you know, somebody like me is not going to be, you know, um, a grandmaster or something along those lines. I'll have, uh, you know, little masteries or <laughs> um, dabbles in, you know, all these different things while I'm going along, along in my life. But that is how, where I get my joy. It's like, I'm not going to get. Uh, you know, any kind of uh, notoriety, I think, uh, for being X, Y, or Z, sure, because it's more like being a jack of all trades. But that doesn't make the way I do things any less enjoyable or any less correct for myself than the way anybody else does things for them. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, let, let's let's shift a little bit. Uh, start to wind down here. This, this has been a wonderful conversation, but of course, as, as I mentioned at the top, we can't do it all day. I got, I got, I got other people to talk to. It's the, the, the downside of us doing several in a day is that there are some, some boundaries I have to watch for. So first off, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate I you coming on. Thank you. Good, good. Now, if, if people are listening and they're saying, you know, I want to get a hold of this guy. Like his story resonates for me. You know, are you willing to share any social media or contact information, email, maybe that, that we could put out to people? Yeah. I mean, if people wish to contact me via email, I am totally fine with that. Okay. Um, you know, and again, I, I tend to be a little guarded so that, you know, it's like depending on how that conversation goes, I can bring them on other things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm totally fine with sharing my email. Okay. What, what is your email address? Um, it is my first initial, uh, first initial last name. So it's S M A T U L E W I C as in cat, Z as in zebra, the number one at gmail.com. There you go. Okay. And then as we, as we close up here, you know, this is your, your, your final words to the audience. You know, I'm going to record an intro and an outro later, but this is your last chance to, talk directly to them. We've been all over the place today. And I mean that in a complimentary way, <laughs> as you, you may not know, everybody listening knows that's my, I love wandering conversations. So how do you want to close this up? What do you want to leave the listeners with today? I would like to leave with 
letting people know that whatever road they're on, it's okay. You know, whatever we're doing, um, you know, where, you know, however you perceive that, you know, where you're going or how you're doing, you know, whether, you know, however, how frustrated you are and maybe, maybe you don't want to continue any further or, you know, that you want to, you know, focus on one thing or that, you know, life is, is sort of, um, pulling you away from martial arts, maybe your desire still to be there for the future, whatever the road is, it's okay. Um, and that the best thing that you can do is again, to bring yourself to that center in your, in your mind and say, where do I go now? Where do I need to be now? And go there and move there. Despite how scary it is, despite how frustrating it is, despite how happy you are, do that. And if martial arts is part of that, that's awesome. If that gives you some part completeness in where you are right now, go there. But also have the flexibility to understand that that road may take you places that you have no idea even existed. And you need to be open to that because that can, that's really where you can, um, start to see what life has ready for you and willing to give you. I told you at the top that I felt like this journey, this story that we were going to hear was a bit more common than society. And honestly, even the show might lead us to believe the vast majority of people who train in the martial arts don't have eighth, ninth degree black belts. They don't have schools or books or movie careers. We feature quite a few of them on the show because, well, let's, let's face it, you all want to hear from those people. But then we hear from someone like Stephen, who, I'll be really honest, I identify with more than just about anybody else that's been on the show because of my varied training experiences and my feeling like sometimes, you know, I ended up at schools that I didn't belong at, but felt trapped or circumstances dictated that it was the best option for me. So Stephen, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the incredible openness with which you shared your story with everyone. And I look forward to getting to talk to you again, and ideally in person. And, you know, there's some, there's some more stuff I want to chat with you about, because I... Like I said, I think we're on the same page. For those of you listening, I hope you'll check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and see the stuff that we've got going on over there. Sign up for the newsletter. Check out the photos of Steven we put up. Check out transcripts from episodes. You know, just whatever over there works for you. Remember, we've got the store at whistlekick.com as well as a ton of ways you can help us out. We've got books on Amazon. We've got social media. It's at Whistlekick, everywhere you can think of. We've got the Patreon. And we've got those training programs. You know, we've got the Fuel program, which is designed to improve your cardiovascular fitness based on modern science, my understanding, tons of research, years of training and coaching. And you know what? It works. So you can check that out. You can find all of our training programs at whistlekickprograms.com because again, I don't name things creatively. <laughs> if you have guest suggestions or feedback, anything like that, that you want to reach out to me, my email is pretty straightforward, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>